Hello everyone, coming to you all, like Kara said, from beautiful Los Angeles, California. I think we can all agree it has been an absolutely fantastic morning. And now we have a time and an opportunity for a really special keynote guest. We have the opportunity to hear from optimist and global best-selling author, Simon Sinek. Simon has devoted his life to advance a vision in which the vast majority of people wake up feeling inspired, safe, and fulfilled by the work that they do. Simon is known for best-selling books, including Start With Why, Leaders Eat Last, and The Infinite Game. You may have heard his podcast, A Bit of Optimism, or seen his TED Talk on the concept of why, which has over 60 million views. Wow. Simon, thank you so much for being with us today. We are super excited to have you. Thanks for having me. Yes. All right, audience, to everyone out there, I have a few questions pre-planned for Simon to get us kicked off and started in this fireside chat. But if you'd like, we'd love for you to jump in to our chat function, and I'll ask Simon those questions that you guys have. All right, Simon, you ready? Ready. All right. <laughs> 60 million views on your TED Talk is super impressive. So tell us the, the why behind how you started this philosophy, what your journey was, and what brought you to the concept of why. It's a very personal story, and quite frankly, it started out of pain. Mm -hmm. I lost my passion for my work. Mm -hmm. um, but superficially, things were good. So I was actually quite embarrassed about saying to people, oh, I don't want to go to work anymore because everything looked fine. Mm -hmm. And so I kept those feelings to myself. Mm -hmm. And if anybody has ever been in a bad place, you know, if you keep those feelings to yourself, they grow. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what happened to me. And it wasn't until a dear friend of mine came to me and said, something's wrong, something's off. And having that safe container, that safe space, I came, I came clean. Mm -hmm. um, it lifted a huge weight off my shoulders. And all that energy that, I went, to, that went into lying, hiding, and faking um, could go into finding a solution. The solution that I found was this thing called the why. I knew what I did. I knew how I did it. Yeah. But I didn't know why I was doing what I was doing. And the ability to articulate my why not only restored my passion to new levels, but the ability to help other people find their why gave me a, a, a renewed sense of purpose. And so that's what I sort of set my life and career to do. It's Absolutely amazing and special. So thank you for sharing that piece. We look forward to digging in a little bit more with it as well. Um, and you mentioned this uh, just a minute ago, and that was around passion. And you've been quoted as saying, working hard for something we do not care about is called stress, but yet working hard for something we love is called passion. Uh, so what are the, some of the maybe key principles that someone can apply to their life to make that transition from stress to passion? I think we misunderstand what passion is. We think of it as an input. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like we only hire passionate people. Well, how do you know that they're passionate for interviewing, not so passionate for working? Mm -hmm. You know, passion is an output, not an input. It's something we feel when we are working in something we love and care about. Passion is what we feel when we work with people who we care for and care about us. Mm -hmm. um, it's got nothing to do with how many hours we work or how hard we work or the stress we feel. Mm -hmm. It's to do with whether all of that feels worth it. If I feel fulfilled by all of that. So passion is definitely an output, which is why it's so important to understand our why. It's why it's so important to uh, uh, contribute to the culture that we're working in, because we want to give to the people we work with, mm -hmm. uh, not just take from them. We want to work in, in cooperation with the people. and All of that contributes to that magical feeling of passion. Absolutely. And it, it gives that community feel and peace to it as well. Exactly. So, thank you. Well, we'll take it to Simon, the, some of the chat functions uh, and the questions that, they, that the team has. Um, and the first one comes in from Angela uh, Monticello, and that is, Simon, what is the biggest challenge facing the business world today, and do you have any advice in overcoming it? I think the biggest challenge we have today, it's, it's the sort of twofold. One is, I mean, COVID definitely took us away from uh, working together. Mm -hmm. And if camaraderie and community and all of these things matter so much to human beings, mm -hmm. it's becoming really, really difficult for us to find that community. Um, I think a lot of companies don't realize that working remotely and building community and trust actually requires more work, not less work. Mm -hmm. it, it's not just yeah. like, you know, it's, it, think of it like school. You can't just have a 50 minute class and repeat, you know, all the time. Uh, 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 and expect kids to learn as easily. You've got to change the way it works. Mm -hmm. um, it's, the same, it's the same thing here. Um, so, and, and we think about community. Do people have the skills? Do they have the human skills 
to build that community, to build those relationships. Um, things like active listening, things like how to have an effective confrontation, things like um, uh, 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 how to give and receive feedback. These are absolutely necessary skills that we aren't learning. So I think companies have a huge opportunity to teach people those skills. Absolutely. That's super exciting to, to hear. And, and yes, uh, yes, agree. So um, we have one from Dustin Harms, and that is, what fulfills you? So, I mean, I'm going to sound like a broken record. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. But uh, the things, there's, there's a couple things. One is I, I love working in teams. I love working with people. Mm -hmm. And the feeling of accomplishing something with somebody is, for me, the best. So, so relationship really matters. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and the other thing is I'm a sucker for people who serve those who serve others. Mm -hmm. I can be brought to tears when I hear stories of somebody who sacrificed themselves, their interests for the good of others. So, yeah. so you know, meeting those people mm -hmm. who, who give and serve in, in work or in, in, in life, um, I, I, I love that. That really feeds me. Oh, good. Thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. Another question, Simon, from Samuel Tenbrink, and that is, how do you deal with negative thoughts? Uh, you allow them to happen. Okay. I think we sort of, we, we sort of, we think we have to be positive all the time. We don't. I mean, human beings are feelings. I mean, human beings have feelings, <laughs> you know, and I guess that's good. Like we are feelings. Yeah. Um, human beings have feelings and we can't deny those feelings. If you're sad, be sad. Allow yourself to be sad. Mm -hmm. If you're, if you're angry, allow yourself to be angry, but just label it. Mm -hmm. I'm sad. Mm -hmm. I'm angry. Mm -hmm. And I think where it becomes dangerous is when we try and suppress it and pretend that we don't have the, those things because we have to be happy all those, yeah. all the time. But allow, allow, allow yourself to be human, I think is the most important thing. And, and be, just be honest with yourself about how you feel. Yeah. And is it, does that then enable you to kind of move past it a little bit of faster or it, process it as you kind of acknowledge it? The, the simple answer is yes. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, sort of going back to my own story, the more one tries to suppress negativity, the more it feeds on itself. Mm -hmm. It's like a valve. When you let it out, it releases the pressure. Mm -hmm. um, most importantly, uh, to let it out to another human being. Yeah. Um, you know, I think we live in this world where, you know, people stand by themselves. Too many people stand by themselves in their rooms with their phones and make a video for TikTok and say how they're feeling. But you're in a room by yourself talking to a piece of technology. You know, you're not actually talking to a person. Sure. Um, but to have that exact same conversation with another human being where you're looking them in the eye mm -hmm. is actually much more difficult, even if you were to say the exact same words. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, there's awesome power in being able to share how you honestly feel with others and that others have the skill set to hold that space not try and fix anything sure. and i think that's the mistake we make when our friends come to us we try and fix mm -hmm. um don't fix just hold space mm -hmm. um and uh yeah that's 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 a magical thing if if, if when you do it well, takes courage fun. takes courage but it's a magical thing absolutely it um it's special yes so another question simon from shelly bunner how do you keep a conversation positive when those around you are negative um so it happens a lot, um, and I sometimes I, I point it out. Yeah. I'm like, mm -hmm. what, what's what's making you so negative? I never say why so negative because it's ironically the question why is actually it's an emotional question. It's it can okay. be perceived as aggressive. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what's making you so negative? Mm -hmm. Like, there's a lot of good things happening here. Mm -hmm. I want to know more. So replacing cura, uh, judgment with curiosity mm -hmm. is, is one part. Um, uh, the other thing is to just allow them to feel that way. So it's like, oh yeah, I hear you acknowledging the negativity mm -hmm. and then sort of moving on. Um, but, but I also find that being focused on where the future is, mm -hmm. um, is important. And by the way, not all negativity is bad. You know, uh, you know, people who, you know, are sometimes very often criticized at work because they're always pointing out the problems and you, you hear bosses say, don't bring me problems, bring me solutions. It's like, well, if I knew the solution, I wouldn't be coming to you, you know? <laughs> yes. Um, uh, I mean, th there's two, there's two types of negative Nellies. You know, there's one that is always negative and offers no solution and stands on the sidelines. Mm -hmm. We have, I don't need those people in, 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 in an organization. Sure. But the people who constantly bring problems, but they're willing to roll up their sleeves and try and find a solution, those people are, in, are extremely valuable mm -hmm. inside an organization because they're helping us see things, uh, cover our blind spots mm -hmm. that we're not seeing. Mm -hmm. um, and they're willing to roll up their sleeves. So not all negativity is bad. Mm -hmm. It's what we do with that negativity afterwards. Mm -hmm. We're willing to work together or willing to just sort of lean back and, and lean out. 
Absolutely. Well, it also kind of reminds me too around, um, you know, you said the word why, right? Mm -hmm. So not pressing into that as a, it, it might be not the right one to say. Mm -hmm. So how do you then ensure that you're kind of teeing it up correctly? Because if it's not all negative and holding that space, are there any other kind of um, tips to ensure that you can call it out, be blunt, but yet uh, process it well together? I mean, again, it is, it is, um, uh, it's, it's not about judgment. Mm -hmm. It's about allowing somebody to be negative, but at the same time we want to redirect. Right. Right. Look, and, and I'll, like I said, I'll say it, I'll say, I, I, I don't know what's making you negative. Yeah. Uh, tell me more. Yeah. We in our, in our company have a rule, which is if the reaction is above a five, mm -hmm. it's about something else. Mm. You know, it's like, why did you leave the fridge open? It's like, Hmm, clearly not about the fridge, <laughs> right? Right. right. Um, you always leave the fridge open. Okay. Yeah. Do not react about the fridge. Sure, sure. <laughs> Absolutely. So it's the same thing. We find that in work. Like people sometimes get very yeah. amped up about something and you sort of pay attention like that reaction to what we're talking about. Don't match. This is about something else. Yeah. And this is where good leadership and good human skills mm -hmm. come into play, which is, are you able to read the room and figure out mm -hmm. what's going on here? Mm -hmm. Are they having a bad day? Is there something else? Or is there something that I don't know about the work that we're doing mm -hmm. that I can easily help address and fix? Or did somebody just hangry or tired? And that's okay, too. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Well, I love the question of tell me more because yeah. um, it opens the door to just that. Tell me more. Go on. What else? Those, those are three magical things to say. Those are great, great yeah. questions to have in your back pocket. Absolutely. Okay, Simon. So another one coming in from Megan Longhurst. And Megan says, how do you not let other people's negative energy or negative kind of context affect you? That's their story. And I, I say that, that it's their story. Mm -hmm. um, I have my life, I have doing my things. Yeah. And, um, um, but I, 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 I don't let other people's negativity affect me because it's, the, it's their life, it's their story. I don't know what's going on. Sure. Now, if it's a close relationship, clearly and someone's in your space or you have a close working relationship with somebody and somebody's in your space and clearly they're negative, but you can address that. Again, this goes back to those human skills. I, I love how we keep coming here, yeah. which is, so many of us, companies so rarely teach us the human skills of how to have difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. So if somebody is constantly negative and it is actually bringing you or the team down, yeah. how do you address that without making it overly aggressive? How do you address that in a way that they will hear you? Mm -hmm. And so the ability to say, I need to have a difficult conversation with you. On thir in Thursday's meeting, you were so negative. It brought the team's energy down and I'm, mm -hmm. I fear that if you continue to bring that negative energy to all of our meetings, that it's going to demoralize the team mm -hmm. and then learn to be quiet and allow somebody to soak that in. Like that, that interaction, we don't teach that. And so usually it comes out wrong and usually it escalates or usually we avoid it. We get passive aggressive at, at work as well. And so things never get addressed. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I think learning the skills of, of difficult human interaction, Absolutely. but by the way, human interaction is very often difficult, um, uh, is, is a massive opportunity for, for corporate America today. Absolutely. And I love how you say, I feel that if we, um, and it really kind of um, maybe de-escalates de things mm -hmm. a little bit and allows for that open conversation. Mm -hmm. And if somebody gets defensive, like, I didn't do that, I'm like, I didn't say you did. I'm telling you how I feel. Absolutely. Right? It's, it's, my feelings are valid, you know? Yes. Yes, they are. So another question from Christina Testa, and that is, what's the most inspirational experience you've ever had? Oh my goodness. I, I, I don't know if I've had the most inspirational experience. <laughs> um, uh, for me, again, it's, it's seeing other people light up. Mm. You know, I get inspired when um, I hear stories of people who've maybe used my work to uh, start a business or profoundly turn their lives around. Um, um, I, I, you know, where people take risk and are willing to work together to do, diff do difficult things, those those stories inspire me. In terms of my own personal experience, I I do a lot of work with the military, and the opportunity to spend time with people who have devoted their lives to service, um, I I get very very inspired when I when I spend time with them. Oh, fascinating! Absolutely, thank you. Another one in from uh, Alexandria Turquist. What are your top three tips for leadership? So you, these these questions come up a lot, you know, and you, yeah. and you said there's articles written about that. It's like, what are the three most important characteristics of a leader? You know, <laughs> vision, charisma, you know, and I've met some wonderful, fantastic leaders who are not big Steve Jobs visionaries. Sure. You know, and I've met some amazing leaders who don't seem to have sort of that 
bounce off the wall charisma, you know, they're sort of the quiet one sitting in the corner. Mm -hmm. um, I am comfortable saying, however, that great leaders, the best leaders I've ever met, they will have courage. Yeah. Um, leadership is extremely difficult. Um, sometimes um, it's thankless, it's lonely. Um, when things go right, you have to give away the credit. When things go wrong, you have to take all the responsibility. Well, that sucks. <laughs> um, uh, and it's sometimes, the, the gains are sometimes not immediate. Um, and it takes tremendous amount of courage uh, to lead. Um, what's more, you know, we talk about integrity. I think integrity takes courage, mm -hmm. you know, to speak truth to power, to do the right mm -hmm. thing in the face of overwhelming pressure to do the opposite. Mm -hmm. um, all of these things take courage, which I think begs the question, then where does courage come from? Yeah. Um, uh, I don't believe that courage is an internal fortitude where you dig down deep and find the courage. Mm -hmm. I think courage is external. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, you know, a world famous trapeze artist has the courage to try a brand new death-defying act for the first time with a net. They wouldn't try it without the net. It's the net that gave them the courage. Mm. And I think so too is it for human beings that the quality of our relationships mm -hmm. um, give us courage. You talk to folks in uniform who do uh, heroic things. Mm -hmm. They'll never say it was for God or country. It was for the person to the left or the person to the right. Mm -hmm. It was the quality of mm -hmm. the relationships. And so for us to build courage, what we have to do is invest in relationships. Because when you're facing a very difficult situation, an ethical challenge, a work challenge, whatever it is, all we need is one person in our lives who says, I've got your back. Mm -hmm. I believe in you. Mm -hmm. You have to do this. It's the right thing to do. And if everything goes sideways, don't worry, I'll be there with you. Mm -hmm. I mean, even just talking about it, you yeah. feel like you have renewed energy. And so if you have one person in your life who can provide that for you at work or at home, um, you'll be amazed the amount of courage you have to do the right thing and to lead. Oh, I love hearing all of that. And yes, you can kind of feel it as you just listen mm. to, um, to, to you, you say it. Uh, Pfizer has four core values and one of them happens to be courage. And so it's a, a great uh, encouragement for uh, our core value and courage. Another question coming in from uh, David Rodriguez, and that is, what, uh, what steps do you take to make yourself better? So I love the idea of learning. And so to, first of all, to make yourself better, you have to recognize that you're not an expert in anything. Yeah. I'm an expert in nothing. I'm a student in the things yeah. that, I, uh, that, I, that I do. And you know, I may be a more advanced student than some people, um, but there's always more to learn. So number one is I, 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 I never think of any ceiling. Um, I always think of the opportunity for constant learning. And two, um, I like being the idiot in the room. Like I like spending time with people who are smarter than me and don't feel the need to compete against them or prove that I know as much or more than they do. Yeah. Um, in fact, I'm very open about it. And the and it kind of goes when we talked about our feelings. You know, when you sort of say, you know, sort of I'm sad, I'm angry, the ability to put that out there, yeah. the ability to put out in the room, um, you guys know more than I do, yeah. or I'm the idiot here. It actually provides relief to you, forget about them, it provide, <laughs> provides relief to you that you can be the idiot in the room and you can soak in new information. Um, so it's one of my favorite things to say to people, which is, you know, you know more about this than I do mm -hmm. um, uh, because it's a relief for me. It lets, it lets me off the hook that I've got nothing to prove. So it's, it's a lot of it is mindset, the mindset of learning. Oh, that's wonderful. Yes, thank you. So Simon, a question from Carlos Flores. Who is your inspirational mentor? So I have a couple. Um, okay. There's a guy by the name of Bob Chapman, who I wrote about in my book, Leaders Eat Last. Mm -hmm. I met Bob um, and I visited his factories uh, and was profoundly moved by what he's building at his company, Barry Waymiller. And just by dumb luck, um, I've become friends with Bob and he's become a, an incredible mentor for me. Um, uh, <laughs> he's become a, an incredible mentor for me. Um, uh, and the other, the other one is a guy by the name of Ron Bruder. Um, who has, he just has believed in me since the beginning. And this is what I've learned about mentors. Yeah. You know, sort of, you know, you, you, a lot of companies have mentor programs, which I think is funny. I don't think you can assign someone to be a mentor. Um, uh, I, I think, uh, for me, a definition of a mentor is someone who always has time for you. Mm. You know, and so what, these people who are way more accomplished than I am, or I was at the time especially, um, you know, I would call them up and they had time for me. I don't know. They saw something in me. Mm -hmm. Maybe they saw themselves in me. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And not everybody has time for us. Those people aren't, won't be your mentors. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and a great mentor relationship, both parties are actually uh, learning, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, mentors you'll find learn from the experience as well. Yeah. So it's not like this wise old person sitting on high giving, dispensing advice, but rather they come with a sense of curiosity as well, which is why they always have time for you. Oh, that's... Wonderful and special and a great reminder 
um, when it kind of goes both ways yeah. uh, in a mentorship capacity. So thank you. Yeah. A question in from Michael Martin. What do you do to refresh yourself? Um, it's not that different than other people. <laughs> <laughs> um, taking breaks. Okay. I mean, I believe, you know, there's this great story of two lumberjacks and every morning they start chopping wood at the same time. And every day they stop chopping wood at the same time. And every day, one of the lumberjacks disappears for about an hour in the middle of the day. And every day he chops more wood than the other lumberjack. This goes on for months. Then finally, the one who works all day stops and says, I have to ask you, every day we start at the same time. Every day we stop at the same time. Every day you disappear for an hour in the middle of the day. Every day I work more hours than you and every day you chop more wood than me. Where do you go for that hour? Yeah. And the other lumberjack looks up and says, oh, I go home and sharpen my ax. Um, and so I'm a great believer in taking breaks. I'm a great believer in turning off. And most of us don't know how to take vacation. We telecommute from a beach. Mm -hmm. That's not taking a vacation. Mm -hmm. That's bringing work with you to your family's vacation. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a great believer that when you have a weekend or a, a, a week off, um, turn off. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there's, there's work to do sometimes, and sometimes it's, it's imperfect. That's okay. Mm -hmm. But where we, we literally have never taken a vacation, mm -hmm. I think that's unhealthy. Mm -hmm. So even if it's just a day off, you know, I'm taking Friday off, you know, yeah. I think that's a, a good thing. A critical piece. Yeah. Absolutely. And is there any way that you're able to disconnect? Do you leave the phone behind? Do you, what are your kind of tips when you're on vacation to truly check out? Um, I don't take my computer with me. Okay. And I don't like answering emails on a phone. I, I find it annoying. Um, <laughs> so I don't take a computer, computer with me. So I don't even have the temptation. Mm -hmm. um, and I tell everybody, um, you know, uh, uh, if there's an emergency while I'm gone, figure it out, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and what you, what you find is that it's incredibly empowering mm -hmm. for a leader, for a leader to say to their team, mm -hmm. you got this, mm -hmm. you know, there are very, very, very few problems mm -hmm. that will come up that require me and only me mm -hmm. to, to, to input. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's very empowering for a team to know that they're, to know that they're responsible while the boss is away. Absolutely. Freeing for you and empowering for them. Exactly. So a win-win. It's a win-win. <laughs> yes. I love it. All right. It goes so back I, to courage, right? <laughs> you got to have the courage. <laughs> have to, have to just like, all right, okay, I'm not going to be involved in this. Yeah. Both ways. Both ways, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, Simon. So from Kristen Davis, uh, what books or podcasts do you utilize to help grow you as a person and as a leader? So um, I've been pretty open about this. I actually struggle to read. Um, mm -hmm. I have ADHD, and so paying attention to books has actually been very difficult. Everybody thinks I'm like this big reader that reads hundreds of books a year. I don't. Um, I've written more books than I've read. Um, uh, uh, but I do like learning. And so the way I learn is from listening. Mm -hmm. So conversations with people who are smarter than me, being, being that student, mm -hmm. um, always having a student mindset. Mm -hmm. And will be curious about what makes other people tick. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, insatiable curiosity in conversations. But I like documentaries as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so two documentaries that I would recommend, which are fantastic for sort of leadership education. Um, one of them is Senna, S-E-N-N-A, uh, -E which is about race car driver Ayrton Senna. Even if you're not into Formula One racing, yeah. it's still a brilliant documentary and it's still very enjoyable. But basically, it highlights these two archetypes, Senna, who drives for passion, mm -hmm. and Alain Prost, who drives for the numbers. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you compare that to our modern day, you know, who's driven by the end of year goal, the mm -hmm. quarterly goal at, you know, at any cost mm -hmm. versus who's the person who does it for the love. Mm -hmm. And you start to see how they command, Senna commands tremendous love and loyalty from the other drivers who are competing against him, mm -hmm. but they support him mm -hmm. where nobody likes Prost. And yeah. you just, it, you start to see these two archetypes and it asks, you know, it's asked the simple question, who do you want to be? Mm -hmm. What kind of life do you want to live? Mm -hmm. um, do you want to live one of passion or one obsessed with numbers? Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, it puts it out there. Yeah. Uh, the other one is Kumare, K-U-M-A-R-E. Okay. Uh, it's it wasn't supposed to be a leadership documentary, but it ends up being a great leadership documentary of a, a documentarian who sets out to sort of mock the sort of guru culture. Mm -hmm. I won't give anything away, no spoilers here, but let's just say <laughs> something goes wrong. Okay, and, uh, and it, it's actually quite interesting. Fascinating. And in the uh, race car, when you talked yeah. about kind of the passion and then versus the numbers, do you see your kind of concept of stress versus passion play out in that as well? And those kind of principles as well? Without a doubt. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the joy that comes um, from doing something 
uh, for the love of it. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, the, I mean, Sen is still a high-performing race car driver. He still wins a lot of races. Sure. You know, when you do something with joy, you do, you do, you are a high performer. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and when you're only doing it for the number, you're only doing it for the result. You know, there's some unethical behaviors that start to creep in. This is what mm -hmm. Prost was accused of, mm -hmm. which is running dri other drivers off the road because he needed the points. And so you start to sort of look at our own work, you know, the people who are only obsessed with numbers, you know, it creates some unethical fuzziness sometimes. Sure. And so I think, I think when you do something for joy, um, uh, it's amazing how, how we become better performers, but also better performers, like more, more honest performers. Oh, that's great. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, Simon. Angela Gaffey uh, asks um, a question around, would you rather ask for permission or just ask for forgiveness afterwards? I mean, that's an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> no brainer. <laughs> yeah, I've said sorry a lot. Um, uh, I, I, I've recognized and learned that um, if I ask to do something that's new or unconventional, I'll get a lot of resistance, not because they don't agree, it's because they've, they're they afraid of the result. Mm -hmm. And um, if I'm willing, even if I'm willing to take all the accountability, mm -hmm. um, I'll give you one silly example. You know, I published a book called Together is Better, which looks like a children's book, but it's for adults. And I did some very new and different things in that book that the publisher was very reticent to do. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, but I sort of went forwards anyway. and. And, and, and it ended up being this <laughs> magical little book that no one ever thought it would be. And, and because they all ignored it, um, mm. the funny thing is it debuted on the New York Times bestseller list and nobody knew because no one was paying any attention to the mm -hmm. silly little book. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but yeah, I, 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 I don't mind helping clean up the mess that I make, but I, I definitely want to drive forwards and try new things. I love being, I love experimenting. And I also know, I think you have to, people who like to experiment, you have to recognize that things don't always go well. Mm -hmm. And when you experiment, you have to take accountability. Mm -hmm. And when you experiment, things do fail. That's mm -hmm. the whole point of experimentation. Because when, if you want everything to go right, that's when you play it safe. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I, I'm totally fine asking for forgiveness. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And a, and a New York Times bestseller, Simon, does not sound like a silly little book. <laughs> so, oh, it is a magical little, it's a That's magical wonderful. Little, very proud of that book. And I, I wrote it specifically to be given away. You know, the opening on the first page, it says to colon from colon. So it's literally a book that you give to people you want to inspire mm -hmm. or to thank people for inspiring you. Oh, how special. That's a gift. Absolutely. Literally. It, it is. All right, Simon. So Nicole DeCourcy asks, what was the last straw that made you think to yourself, I have to make a change and figure out my why and get out of my current situation? So, I mean, I went back to the, that experience I had many years ago where it was, it was darkness that made me realize I had to make a change. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very common for people who are in dark spaces. You realize if I, you know, I'm, I'm at a fork in the road, mm -hmm. I either have to affect change or I don't know how this plays mm -hmm. out, but it's not good. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think a lot of people have faced that fork. Um, and again, I was very lucky. I had a friend there to hold space for me, which gave me courage, goes mm -hmm. back, yeah. goes back again to friendship. Um, but, uh, um, but if we sort of take it to something more, more recent, um, you know, for example, I didn't write anything during COVID and everybody was like, oh, did you use yeah. the time during COVID to write a book? Yeah. And the answer was, no, that's, I, that, I can't write that way. I need human interaction. Yeah. And so it was, it was a creative, you know, sort of, uh, uh, cemetery for me. There was no big ideas, yeah. um, nothing worth writing about anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and, um, I don't believe in writer's block. I believe that you're in the wrong environment for creativity to happen. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of people, when they run out of ideas or they get stuck, they blame themselves. Mm -hmm. I don't, I blame my environment. Um, and so that's easy to change because mm -hmm. it can't change me, but I can change my environment. Um, and so, for example, this year I wasn't having any ideas and I tried different things and it wasn't working. And so I did, I took a risk and I moved to another country for 11 weeks. Mm -hmm. I moved to the UK for 11 weeks for no other reason than to shake things up and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And the ideas bubbled. It's absolutely wonderful. So I'm a great believer in changing your routine, mm -hmm. doing something different, putting your desk in a different in a different way, you know. Uh, start inviting a friend over. I do, I've done this one as well. A, a friend who has, is in a completely different line of business who has nothing to do with what I do because well, so many of us are working from home by ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Find another friend who works from home by themselves who might be in a completely different company. Work together mm -hmm. and simply sit in a room together. It's amazing what happens. The ideas that flow and just having a work buddy, mm -hmm. things like that. Experiment mm -hmm. with entirely new different ways of working. Mm -hmm. Not all of them will work, and you find the one that works for you. And when that stops working, you try something new again. 
Absolutely. I love that piece. And it sounds like it can be a small change, a small tweak to, yeah. to a big change to, to move to the UK. To, to move to the UK for a, <laughs> yeah. for a few weeks. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, what uh, do you, this is from Amy Hajaku and that is what's your greatest fear? Um, I guess it sounds silly, but I think my greatest fear is that my luck will run out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm happy go lucky. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, people say you make your own luck. I mean, I don't, I don't know if that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've been very, I, I, you know, my, my work has, has, has gone on longer than I expected that it had, it has, you know, um, than I expected it would rather. Um, you know, when I wrote Start With Why, I thought, okay, I'll probably get three years out of this, maybe mm -hmm. five at the most, and then it'll be over and it just keeps going. So yeah. I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Absolutely. Well, um, we are too. <laughs> uh, so Simon, we've got another question uh, from Marie Letisa, and that is, uh, you spoke about your mentors previously. Mm. How do you express gratitude towards those that have poured into you? Oh, literally, I call them up and say thank you. <laughs> I mean, that's exactly what I do. Yeah. Um, I'm, I make a point of, of saying thank you to people um, um, when they least expect it. I, I like mm -hmm. the telephone, mm -hmm. you know, picking up and calling, picking Absolutely. up the phone and calling someone saying, hey, I, I don't think I've told you this, Noel, but I'm really, really grateful for what you've given me. Mm -hmm. You know, some of them are good at receiving compliments and, and gratitude and some of them aren't. Yeah. And they deflect. But, but no, I, I'm a great believer that, you know, send a card to someone, mm -hmm. you know, so just say, and, and, and I think we're all guilty of this, which is we don't call people sometimes who we miss or who we love because you're like, oh, I want to, you know, I want to talk to them for a sizable period of time. Mm. I mean, I'm either too tired or the time zones don't work out. And, mm -hmm. you know, I couldn't find an hour. And I've made that mistake. Mm -hmm. But sometimes calling someone up and saying, I only have five minutes. You know, I'm running to a meeting. But I just wanted to say thank you to you. You're on my mind. And I just want to say thank you. It, it does. It goes a long way. It's such a great tip for life. Absolutely. Mm. agree. I've made that same mistake mm. before. And so thank you for that encouragement. One more, one more question, Simon. And that is... Um, if you, um, if you had to say kind of like what you most admire in an amazing leader, what are those characteristics and what would that be? So we talked about courage, mm -hmm. um, but somebody who stays true to vision, I find mm -hmm. very impressive. You know, I meet a lot of people who talk about vision and cause, um, but at when they face the slightest pressure, they veer, mm. or they f face a difficulty, they change strategies. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of respect for people who who are very, very cause driven. Mm. Um, um, I mean, a lot of the leaders that we celebrate, whether you like their personalities or not, you know, your Steve Jobs and Elon Musk's and mm. you know Richard Branson's. I mean, they're very fixated on where they're going, this idealized mm -hmm. sense of the future, and they're they're going to stay on that. They're going to stay on that path. Um, we can debate whether there are better ways that they could do it or, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the cultures they create around them. But I have a lot of respect for people who, who have vision and stick to it. It takes a lot of grit. Absolutely. A lot of grit is right. So, Simon, you balance your time really well. And, and Mickey Boyce has noticed that as well and has asked you, how do you do that? How do you balance your time so well? Uh, believe it or not, uh, I use my schedule. I mean, I'm a slave to my schedule like so many other people. And mm -hmm. I open my schedule and I go, okay, that's my week. <laughs> yes. um, and so I literally build the balance in. Mm -hmm. um, um, I will block off an entire Friday, for example. Mm -hmm. And though I will work on Fridays, no one is allowed to schedule anything on a Friday. Mm -hmm. So I, I have no pre-scheduled anything on a Friday. Mm -hmm. Um, and that allows me to have creative time, mm -hmm. but it allows me to build in that balance. And um, um, I've been doing that for years, and it wasn't necessarily a whole Friday. Sometimes it was a few hours. So between these hours and these hours, you know, this hour and this hour, I wouldn't schedule anything, and, and I was protective of it. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, and, and like we think of things like working out, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, we think of these things as flexible. Or we put in creative time, we think of it as flexible, and somebody says, oh, can I see you at 3 o'clock, and you look in your calendar, and you know, three o'clock was your workout or three o'clock was your, your creative time. And you go, yeah, I can do three. And I say, oh, sorry, I have something else at three. What, you know, do you have any other options? Yeah. I am very protective. Mm -hmm. Now it's not ideal. Sometimes if it's very important, of course I'll, I'm, I can make the shift. 
Um, but I'm I'm really protective of those of those blocks that I block out for working out or for for creative time. They're just they're not available. They don't have to know why. I can't see them. Sure. You know, I, I don't think anybody wants to know. I can't meet with you because I'm working out. But sometimes that's what it is. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just really protective of those times. Well, that's an important piece to be that protective of a viewer and your time. So outstanding balance. And, and even if it's just an hour a week. Hey, you got to start somewhere, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, Simon, thank you so much for your time. It has been an absolute joy and privilege. And um, we've I know I've loved it. I know the audience back at home has as well. So thank you so much. We greatly appreciate you and the important value of your time. And um, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you.